Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think you'll all agree that session one was excellent uh, this morning, or whatever time of day it was where you are. Um, and now we are delighted to introduce uh, session two. And um, we'd like to introduce Teresa Pressas, uh, who will be leading session two of our four pillars, which is corporate leaders and the financial world. Hello, Teresa, I can see you. Can you see me? And can you hear us? I think you might be on mute. I am. Ah, okay. I'm excellent here. excellent Hi, to see you. Hi. Good to see you again for about the tenth time today. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. But it's always a pleasure. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Teresa is is very well known ah, in the circular bio sorry. economy. Oh <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> As well, you can see, we are live. Okay, I apologize. Uh, yes, not I a problem. Didn't... I'm okay. just going to do yes. a, a very brief introduction introduction of you. Okay. Yes, please. Teresa is a very well known in the circular bioeconomy. A lot of uh, you will already know her. Um, she was the director general of CEPI for many years. CEPI is a confederation of European paper makers. And we at the forum see the pulp and paper industry as a great illustration of the circular bioeconomy in action. Teresa is now a consultant in the bioeconomy, as well as a very welcome member of the advisory board and the main board of the forum. So Teresa, welcome, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Mark. I hope the phone doesn't drink again. Um, <laughs> thank you, and good day to all of you. Very nice having you all here. Uh, thank you for joining this session that will deal, will elaborate on the second pillar of the world bioeconomy structure, corporate leadership and finance, sustainable financing. Our aim with this session is to highlight the role of the economy in the bioeconomy. So the corporate world, industry, business, finances are opening new paths in the transition to a low carbon society. And that has to be taken in consideration when developing strategies and policies. And earlier on this morning, uh, well, this morning, the first, the first session, I don't know how many of you were there. It was very interesting because a question from the audience was asked, was referring to the role or asking about the role of business and industry in the development of bioeconomy strategies and policies. And the answer, one of the answers was no government can set the bioeconomy. And I, I thought that was very relevant for uh, this uh, session today, this afternoon. So, in fact, Business success depends on the advancement of the economic, social, and environmental transformation. But that transformation will not happen without business. In the past few years, business industry has been forced to change business as usual due to the, well, we all know, due to the different challenges uh, and crises that we have gone through. But at the same time, it has shown and proved, if that was necessary, that business industry can also adapt to and adopt sustainable business, new sustainable business models based on renewable resources. So it is essential to give a prize to the benefits of the bioeconomy in order to mobilize funds to accelerate the development. And that's what will be dealing in this panel now, the first panel in this, uh, in this second uh, session. So having said that, and again, I welcome all of you, but Michael will then moderate the panel. And it is my pleasure to introduce you the keynote speaker uh, for the panel, Rafael Cayuela. Uh, Rafael is a, a high executive in uh, DAO, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, where he has uh, different roles and different titles. Um, he's uh, also chairing the EU Sustainable Leadership Team. Uh, he is a Strategy Development Directive for the Chief Economist, and his responsibility is defining and accelerating the European Middle East 
uh, European, Middle East and Africa sustainable digital and growth transformation strategy. Externally, uh, Rafael participates or, is ch or chairs a number of working groups, namely in CEFIC, the um, European Chemical Industry Association, but also in the International Advisory Board of the World Energy Council and the Industry Advisory Panel of the Energy Charter Treaty. Rafael is an economist with over 20 years in the uh, chemical industry, and he holds a master's degree on uh, economics from College of Europe and uh, um, business, in, uh, in, and he has, has master's degrees in business as well as executive training uh, in a number of different universities in the US and the UK. But Rafael is also a writer. And he is the author of the book, The Chemical Industry by 2050. So he could really fill up a whole session in this, uh, in this conference because he's writing another book, The Chemical Industry Under the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Oof. Having said that, Rafael, please, the floor is yours now. Uh, you should, you, you muted. Yes, okay, yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity to, to, to share some views about how someone that shares your common interest and has been going through the sustainability journey, as all of you already for more than 15 years, is now basically moved from what you said, the future, looking into the future to the present. So I've been moving from talking about what needs to be done to having the opportunity and and uh, and kind of in my role to start leading this transformation. So I'm very keen to share today some of the things that we are doing in DAO and how do we want to influence the governments, how do we work with industry, governments and civil society to basically this to achieve this growth transformation. So I'm going to share some of the slides uh, that actually we share internally and, and provoke a little bit of discussion for later on, where I think my idea is that Unfortunately, I couldn't join this forum before for personal reasons, but I was very happy uh, to join finally uh, for after many years of doing that. But more important, I think this this particular forum is going to become even more important into the future, as you will see later today. So I will start sharing my slides. Hopefully you can hear me and see me as well. OK, can you see the slides? So this is. Uh, basically the way we address this transformation. So this net zero transformation is basically the most important thing is, is the next growth frontier for every company, every industry, and to be honest, even every nation, as you will see later on, and you know very well. I think we are overwhelmed by, of course, the amount of uh, the amount of transform transformative waves that we are currently facing in the middle of basically getting rid of COVID still handling the second and perhaps the biggest economic recession of this century still is not finished. Uh, certainly, we thought that climate change and biodiversity collapse are actually the major challenges for this decade. You will see later on, as you know very well, this is not anymore by the end of the decade, it's probably now. And this is why the sense of urgency is going to even double down, and you will see that in my messages. Well, if this is not enough, the reality is that we were already, since according to the World Economic Forum, entering into what they call the fourth industrial revolution, the digital revolution, that in our view is a little bit broader. And that's the reason of my book, because it's basically the transformation on the sustainable side, the digital revolution and the societal revolution. So this is, of course, overwhelming, but I think we, we managed to do this transition and we have to manage to do this transition. This basically speaks for a completely turning point and a revolution in all of the industries where we engage, including our own industry. So that basically talk about a completely new period of innovation. However, the quick question mark is that something happened in the 24th of February that, of course, as we know, this is putting a lot of questions on where are we on this transformation. And you will see that I think this is actually going to go even faster. And I hope this is basically what we are going to see. The current situation and the emergency of the Russian invasion to Ukraine is actually going to trigger even a faster expedition of our climate transformation, hopefully. So let me start by something that you, most of you, you know, but I wanted to give you a glance. So this is something part of my first book when I was talking about basically climate change as a business opportunity. This is basically reflecting on what has been happening over the last 14 years. 
where we have been seeing, of course, a tremendous amount of economic growth, correct? We saw in 1970, 40 years ago, a little bit now 50, we basically double population, we double the GDP, and we double CO2 emissions. And of course, that is a great accomplishment in the sense that we managed to reduce our energy dependency as well as our carbon emissions versus the global GDP. However, we did two things that they were not obviously sustainable. One is we already surpassed our planetary boundaries and the use of resources. That's why circularity and energy efficiency is critical. But more important, as we look into the future, we already knew that moving into 2050, so the next 40 years, we might quadruple our GDP, but we will double our emissions. And of course, we will double the use of resources being completely unsustainable. Of course, tackling that has been very difficult over the last 10, 15 years, because of course, what we need to do under the Paris Agreement or the net zero is basically live with 15 gigatons, that is basically 13 gigatons under the two degrees Celsius scenario or net zero by 2050, basically under the 1.5. That basically we put that in context, what we are saying is that we want to have the same level of emissions as in 1970, having three times more population in an economy that is 20 times bigger. And of course, this has been a high, a massive political uh, challenge, correct? And is obviously a massive economical issue, but it's even more important in technological issue. It's actually something more important. It's a huge business transformation and massive growth opportunity. Because when I did this calculation and I was living at this time in the United States, that was not very popular if you are in 2010, correct? Talking about sustainability as a massive growth transformative opportunity. But it was very simple. If you take the amount of emissions that you need to have versus basically where you have to go, so from the 65 gigatons projected of CO2 equivalent by 2050 versus the 15, and this is an old calculation, you can immediately calculate and say, look, at the price of carbon at that time, that it was 30, today we have 90 in Europe, this is a huge transformative opportunity where the companies, the industries, the governments that might basically manage and lead this transformation, they will be the winners of the future. The companies, the industries, the nations that they don't do that, they will be basically lose that war or this kind of competition for the future. And of course, we already have massive evidence, as you know very well, because we have been seeing sustainability associated with multiple massive growth in many industries, from renewables to power substitution to chemical to electrical vehicles and so on. So this is basically the narrative that we use. But where are we on this revolution? Well, I think last year we got a massive warning that, as you know, in the corporate world, when you talk about red codes, and this is what the UN was basically saying, and the Secretary General was saying, humanity is under red code. And of course, this is nothing new for some of you that we have been following, correct, this for years. But this is different because this is the first time that this saying, this is not about the planet, this is about us in the planet. And basically, when you are in the corporate world, when you have a red code, what do we do? In the corporate world, when you have a red code, you do two things. First of all, you stop doing something to do something different. And this is very important because this is a massive warning that we have last year. Three days later, and probably some of you, you know it, Three days later, this was August 14. This is the view on the top of Greenland, in the top of the mountain on Greenland. This is an observ international observatory center that is basically checking the amount of ice. And probably if you are in Finland, you are much more knowledgeable than me on this. But this is what happened three days later after the warning from the UN. It was rain. This is the first time that you are at 3,200 meters high in the middle of Greenland, and basically you have rain. What it means is that it's not only that we need to reduce our emissions drastically. By the way, what the UN report was basically saying is that if we have a run rate of 36 gigatons of CO2 annually, we need to move now, not tomorrow, now, to 10. Because the current budget from now to 2030 is 300 gigatons of CO2. So let's put the numbers, and I think this is why important economics sometimes might be on this calculation. So we are basically saying from now to 2030, we have a 300 gigatons that we are currently running at 36. So we have a current budget of 900. At the current run rate, we will have 900 when all we can use is 300. Of course, this is not about carbon mitigation, it's adaptation, because we know that we are currently running at 1.1 degrees Celsius, and what we are seeing is that all these things, and you know that very well, will start triggering physical risk. And as you know, once you unfreeze the Greenland, or we, once you unfreeze or basically melt the, the ice from the Antarctica, what happens is that you cannot put it back into the fridge. 
So basically, you don't want to enter into this kind of spaces. Where are we? The reality is that there's plenty of evidence that the thing is accelerating, not only for what is happening this summer. We can see things in the Doomsday Glacier. We can see in the Larsen B Glacier in the south. We can actually see the Amazonas is reaching a tipping point, moving from a carbon source, from a carbon sink to a carbon source. The point is even we can see in chemicals, correct, that chemical, chemical pollution has exceeded significantly the um, planetary boundaries. So the sense of urgency is very clear. But this is not enough. At the same time, we also have for this decade is the time in which we are going to see computational capacity of one computer surpassing the computational capacity of one main one brain power, sorry, one person. So that basically means we are going to see significant amount of digital disruptions and disruptions. So with all that in mind, what does it mean for us? I think for our industry, what it means in chemicals in general is we have multiple transformations moving into carbon neutral, net zero, fully circular, safer and healthier materials. It also means that when we put the sustainable and the digital revolution together, to be honest, what happens is the industry that we have today, the crackers of today, the value chains of tomorrow, the value of today is not the value of tomorrow. So what is that value? Well, let me start for something critical. If we want to move humanity, and we want from red code to green code, the most important thing is understanding that materials, cement, steel, but chemicals, play a massive role to decarbonize all the value chains. If we don't decarbonize chemicals, we don't decarbonize electronics, construction, automotive. In other words, if we don't decarbonize ourselves or defossilize ourselves, we don't defossilize other industries. And, and this is basically a petrochemical plot. So as we go now through the journey, you see a scope one, a scope two, and a scope three for emissions. That could be for a company like us, a large petrochemical company. We could do like 100 million tons of emissions. Scope one, scope two, scope three. Very important for the bioeconomy forum. Where is scope three playing a role? Where is bioeconomy playing a role? Here. So if you don't decarbonize, if you don't move into bio, into scope three, you don't decarbonize the chemical industry. And if we don't decarbonize ourselves, we don't decarbonize other value chains. So very important. Our success in our industry to move into the bio space or renewable carbon, as you will see later on, is the success of other industries, is the success of humanity. So the stakes are very, very clear. So, and of course I can give evidence, correct, on what can be done here. So this is, I will probably for the sake of time, maybe to allow maybe time for questions, I will, I will skip that thing. But you can have like very clear scenarios where basically you can go for renewable electricity. Well, first of all here, the point I wanted to make is that it's not only about what do we do in the way we produce, scope one, scope two, scope three, very important in bioeconomy in the scope three. It's also very important to recognize that in the carbon footprint of our material, circularity is half of the carbon content. Today, circularity is taking like something to reduce waste. Circularity in the future is something to tackle CO2. And this is even more critical for that, where the bioeconomy will have a much bigger role because bio combined with CCU or new processes basically will move chemistry from being a bio, uh, basically a completely net zero or even carbon sink in the future. So with all that in mind, the question is, where are we? Well, I think, and you remember I said, August 11 last year, we have a, a warning, humanity under red code. 24th of February this year, we have a new paradigm having war in, war in Europe. And of course, creating an energy crisis that we have today. But something else has happened. This summer, we have one of the large, largest and biggest heat waves around the world, not only in Europe, having the, five, the, the drought, biggest drought in 500 years, as we have been seeing, but actually we have it globally. We have situations, tremendous, terrible situations in Pakistan, in India, in China, in United States. And even we have one year later, the following warning. This is the statement from the head of the space agency, the European Space Agency. If we think the European energy crisis is critical, and it is, the climate risk is even bigger. So this is my challenge to the team today. Today, we are living in a world in which we are focusing in the short term. That is, of course, the war in Russia and the energy crisis and inflation that we have associated. I think we are going to be soon moving, sooner than later, from the war in Europe to the war with nature. 
And this is a more critical one because if I take the war against nature or basically rebalancing humans with nature as the first thing that we have to do, our industry have a massive role, as I said before, to move humanity from green code, sorry, from red code to green code. And I think now, I think very soon, hopefully, we are gonna see that the war in nature is really becoming the key one. And if I take this as an assumption, and the war in the nature is very important, the role of forums like this is gonna even become even bigger. But I will look anymore, I will give you some recommendations as an economist, how do I look into that, building basically what Teresa was saying before, acknowledging, acknowledging that doing this transformation in this journey as a company, as an industry, even as a cluster, or even as a government is not enough. You have to do it all together. What are the things that we need to do today if we will be the last day? Well, first of all, our GDP model, this is a kind of recipes that I've been building for things that we need to do it. If we will be today, imagine we are today in March 2020. So just at the beginning of COVID. One month later, we did amazing things that we never thought that we could do. I think we are reaching this tipping point in which we are gonna be challenging everything to do what we have to do, that is live with this carbon budget of 300 gigatons. First of all, our current growth model in GDP is of course completely obsolete because if I will put external environmental externalities like carbon or water, we know that we have not, have not been growing. In reality, my chart is misleading because if I will put a carbon price of 75 or 100, growth has been negative for decades. And this is not including biodiversity losses, not including uh, catastrophic things. So the model is misleading. Second is that the growth model that we have today, it has to encompass with a massive transformation on energy, transportation, materials, at least or at, at the beginning, but really need to go into massive transformation if we want to accomplish and we want to accomplish what we have to do. We need to address supply supply side, the demand side, and of course, very critical for today, the financial side, because if you don't have the right financial side, you things will not happen. On the demand side, very important, we need to empower citizens to take the right decisions. We will never manage, and this is some of the things I, I, I always share with the European Commission, I want an ETS on citizens. I want citizens being able to calculate the carbon footprint of our actions, scope one, scope two, scope three, circularity. So this is a complete revolution in the way we do things. If I look at into the supply side, we want, we need a global carbon price, high carbon price, a global one, maybe even a water price. We need access to renewable carbon, so bio, CO2, waste. We need carbon capture globally, not for 2050, because remember when you have a red, basically what our doctor has been telling us as a planet Earth is that we have a heart attack. And when you have a heart attack, you don't go for a 50% emission reduction for 2030. Or in other words, you don't say, I'm gonna stop quitting. So you go to your doctor, you have a heart attack, and then you say, what are you gonna do? You have to stop quitting. No, can I do 50%? No, you do 100% now, as soon as possible. So if the time of the war on climate is now, we need to have access to CCUS globally at 100%, not for 2050, but for 2030. We need to move from basically low carbon, e-cracker, new technologies to even synthetic biology, quantum chemistry. We need to work for advanced recycling and enzymatic processes. And on the financial side, we have taxonomies around the world, but they need to be aligned. They need to move from the public side to the private side because it's a lot of industries operating in the state-owned enterprises. And ultimately, we need to accelerate investment to, again, in under red coast, you stop doing something and you do something else. So let's really sure that the companies, the industries, and the nations that really want to drive this innovation get the full support to do that. Having said that, my final slide is basically, I think COVID-19 has reminded us something very powerful in my view. It's basically nature is always much more powerful than humans. And this is, time is not gonna be different. So under the fourth industrial revolution, I think hopefully we need to really move from the war on energy in Europe to the real war that is the war between how to rebalance nature and humans. Explore the molecular universe using the new technologies, design, design the molecules of the futures, and basically take control of our own future. And in this regard, I can only encourage this forum and others to be bold, to go even faster, and to enjoy the exciting times that we have in front of us 
knowing that chemistry is at the cornerstone of this transformation. We don't move your society from red code to green code, and if we don't move materials to become sustainable. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Sorry to rush you a little bit, and hopefully you get an inspiration of what do we discuss in DAO is, and what do we try to accomplish. Of course, this is not easy, as you know very well, but this is kind of our vision and happy to have questions or comments later on around that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this intriguing presentation because it's a bit like a doomsday scenario, which we are in, of course, we all know, but at the same time, I hope the positive aspect of this uh, dual perspective that you brought to us. So thank you very much. And a very good, not checklist, but almost of things that have to be done. So thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Matthias, is there any particular question? I would like to come up with one, with one question, please. With all the challenges, uh, with all the uncertainties in the financial markets, what does that mean for financing the bioeconomy, especially? So that we really focus on the bioeconomy, please. Who else could give us an answer, though? Please. Probably the whole panel. But the whole uh, panel. That, yeah. Or maybe uh, we have to bring that question please, again later uh, on. But that is one point. Yeah. What does that mean for the bioeconomy? Yeah, I think I think I can give you one one point, and maybe as as a corporation uh, trying to navigate correct through this journey, that maybe help and complement others' view. the The first thing to understand is what is the role of the bioeconomy in the whole equation, and as you saw before, the the role of the bioeconomy in the whole equation. If you take one ton of CO two, if you have a ton of plastics or chemicals you deliver five tons of CO2 for every ton that you have, of which two and a half is a scope one, a scope two, a scope three, and two and a half is circularity. So you will take that thing as a starting point, and all you want to do is to reduce your carbon emissions to the budget. Where would you address this issue first? Circularity, and of course, a scope three and bioeconomy. So the first thing I think is educating, and it's not easy, by the way, the financial institutions. So where is the point, the biggest point with the highest return for action? And I think this is the first thing that we have to do. Financial institutions cannot deal what is the real understanding or what is the impact of the return on capital or something where actually you don't understand what is the big thing. So the big thing that we have to do is to explain what is the impact of what you do in the big context, creating the framework. Today is not the framework. If you look at today in Europe, we don't have the framework because basically we are pursuing X scope one, the next, hopefully the next green deal and following uh, following versions of that, they will start looking hopefully into, I don't care if it's scope one or scope two or scope three, what do you really care? You care about the total carbon content of what you have. Ultimately, you will pay for the carbon content. You will really care more about bioeconomy than what you are today. So the, the, the short answer to your question is, I think there is a massive educational uh, process that of course is normal because this is a journey to explain what is the final contribution from a carbon point of view and understanding that the carbon of today is not the carbon of tomorrow. It will have a price of 100 euros carbon price or even if you have an individual ETS you will see how people will run to do that. So we don't have the right framework. We need to build up that framework and we need to show what is the contribution. So if you don't have that, economics might not fly because people is looking into the wrong area. Hopefully that if I sort okay. of answer to that. Okay, no, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Rafael. Thank you very much. Thank you, and you, you, you're welcome to stay on. Uh, I will now um, introduce you to your moderator, uh, Michael Nettersheim. He's a founding partner of the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund. And for more than eight years, Michael was responsible for bioeconomy-related investments at uh, BASF Venture Capital. And after that, he continued uh, his uh, professional life being involved in investment management in other organizations, both private and public companies. Michael has a, a doctorate degree in chemistry from the University of Bonn, and he also has uh, an MBA um, executive program. He has been a certified biotech analyst uh, for the German Association of Financial Analysis and asset management. But not only that, 
and I, I dare not say more important, but uh, not only this uh, this uh, um, interesting and appealing CV. Michael has been with the World Bioeconomy Forum since the start. He is a very precious contributor to guide us uh, in the advisory board to guide us into the financing of the bioeconomy. So over to you, Mike. And again, thank you, Rafael. Yeah, thank you, Teresa, for these really um, kind words. Uh, I'm getting red, uh, to be honest. Um, yeah. But uh, hopefully I will not do this alone because I have uh, great panelists uh, with me. And uh, uh, I will just give you the names and then uh, make the individual introduction. So uh, with us uh, today are Virginia Abuzzolo, Head of Program Circular Bio-Based Europe Joint Undertaking. Then Ben Wicker, Senior Sector Specialist, Land Use, Forest and Ecosystems at the Green Climate Fund. Then Yamo Heinonen, Senior Director, Innovation Ecosystems Industries at Business Finland. And last but not least, Mark Vishny, Chief Sustainability Officer and Head Landscape Capital at BTG Pactual Timberland Investment Group. Uh, especially, Mark, thank you. For you, it's in the middle of the night. Others uh, would be in their dreams where you are. So um, thanks. I, I hope we keep you awake. Uh, at least I will uh, try to uh, facilitate this. Um, I start with uh, Virginia. Uh, Virginia is for 20 years uh, with uh, EU and research innovation policies. She was involved with the GD Enter DG Enterprise and Industry, contributing to the European Union's Earth Observation Program, Copernicus. Uh, later on, she served at the Research Executive Agency, being responsible for the execution of part of the FP7 and Horizon 2020 research framework programs. Since September 2020, she is the head of program in the Circular Bio-Based Europe Joint Undertaking, which was previously the BBI Jew Bio-Based Industries Joint Undertaking. And we are glad that this uh, successful story uh, continues. Virginia holds a PhD in plant ecology and biology from uh, Catania University in Italy. Virginia, please. Thanks a lot for this introduction. And uh, if I have a few, few minutes now to present indeed uh, the circular bio-based joint undertaking, just let me know if you see the few slides I prepared. I think they are on, I hope in full screen now as well. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you. I would like indeed to introduce very briefly what we are trying to do in the European context with the European Union and the bio-based industry consortium. So we want to really do what we just heard. We want to create a competitive bioeconomy for our sustainable future in Europe and beyond. And how we want to do that? Uh, we want to tackle some of the biggest challenge we know that exist in bioeconomy. And how to do that is to bring together the public and the private. We are in fact a public-private partnership of 2 billion Europe. And this is going to be done together, the European Commission representing the public interest and the bio-based industry consortium that is bringing the industrial point of view and the stakeholder point of view. So what we do is uh, to make the European Green Deal real, having an instrument that can support the deploy, the development and the achievement that we are trying to do. And we do this throughout the, what is the uh, European Research and Innovation Program called now Horizon Europe. So we are part of this bigger program of innovation and research, and we tackle specifically what we need to do at European level to make the bioeconomy a reality and to push forward the development of our industry and in the sector in wider sense. So we are not starting from scratch, as already anticipated. We have been already investing in the past framework program through the BBI JU, and now we are uh, moving to the next phase from last year with the aim of specifically supporting the projects that will develop the solution that we need, the bio-based solution in terms of materials, products, and in wider sense of solution for the bio-based sector from waste and biomass in a way that is innovative, that is sustainable, and is circular. And that's the biggest challenge we have. We are trying really, as I said, to make a significant contribution to the European Green Deal, contributing to the climate target, but as well to 
increasing the sustainability and circularity of what we would like to develop, as well as the sourcing, the sustainable sourcing and conversion of the biomass that we need to use to deploy the solution that we are doing. With the specific also objective to ensure the deployment, that this doesn't remain under research and innovation, let's say bubble, but it go to market and has impact at the social and at the regional level, it allowed to create growth and jobs for our sake. So the ambitions are a lot, but if we want to summarize in a few words, we have three main objectives that we are tackling. One is to ensure the acceleration of the innovation that we need to deploy the solution. Two, ensure that we accelerate the market deployment, so the investment that are needed to ensure that we go to market and we get out from the lab and we ensure that the solutions that are mature are, re are available for all our consumers. But that we do this, ensuring a very high level of environmental performance of all the bio-based industrial systems that we need to develop. And uh, how do we do that? And this is my last slide. We fund projects, so we are indeed a financial instrument in that sense, that are mainly having three objectives. One is to develop and validate technologies up to a technology readiness level that we say at lab level to scale up that this technology as such that we can demonstrate in the real environment, so TRL 6 and 7, but we also invest heavily in large scale, first of its kind product facility in Europe with what we call the flagship biorefinery that are funded throughout our program. And with this, I stop my very brief presentation of what we are trying to do at European level. Thank you, Virginia. Thanks a lot for uh, explaining this. And uh, um, our next panelist is uh, Ben Vickers from the Green Climate Fund. Ben has 25 years uh, of experience in the fields of forestry and rural development. Since obtaining um, a master degree in forestry from the University of Oxford, he has lived in Nepal, Vietnam, India, and Thailand, working throughout Asia and with short-term assignments in the Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa region. Uh, in his career, he has been focusing on supporting the integration of the forest sector into national climate change mitigation and adaptation policies, in particular through the REDD Plus program. He coordinated the work of FAO on Red ED um, Plus in the Pacific uh, region, including throughout the UN RED program, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility of the World Bank, and the development and initiation of projects under the Green Climate Fund. Ben, the stage is yours. Thanks, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, and apologies for those acronyms, which may not be familiar to everybody. Um, let me also try to find my um, my uh, PowerPoint to share. This is this one. Okay, so this should now be working. Um, okay, so very briefly, I'm here representing the Green Climate Fund. Um, we are the world's uh, largest climate fund, and we were set up by the UNFCCC and served the Paris Agreement. We support developing countries to transition to uh, climate resilient and low emission economies. So just a brief um, overview of how we work. We're country driven. So we have a readiness program that supports country planning. We have, we have programming which is aligned with country policies. We're an open partnership organization. We have over 200 accredited entities and delivery partners through whom we work. We use a range of financial instruments. Uh, we leverage blended finance and we pilot support for new financial structures. And we work through a balanced allocation where we target a 50-50 split of our finances to go to climate change mitigation and adaptation and we are risk taking patient capital using organization we accept higher risk we support early stage project development and innovations to catalyze climate finance from other sources um, and how we we drive change um, so we we establish environment uh, we, establish an enabling environment for novel climate solutions from, uh, from 
around the world from uh, by um, by catalyzing innovation. Um, we de-risk and mobilize finance at scale uh, in a way that other um, climate funds are, are not enabled to do as effectively. And we strengthen national financial institutions to drive the adoption of novel climate solutions. And, and this is a, a key part of our mission, our mandate, working directly with institutions in developing countries to build their ability to continue this mission over the long term. So that, that's an, an, an abridged um, uh, overview of what the Green Climate Fund is and how we work. Um, I would say that we we are um, also add that we have about eleven billion dollars of finance mobilized to date, about a quarter of which um, could be classified as contributed to the economy. Um, and that is uh, that is what I have for you as an introduction. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ben. Um, I come to uh, Jamo Heinonen from uh, Business Finland. Uh, Jamo served in his early days of his career as the head of uh, Tekes uh, Shanghai, Tekes being the Finnish uh, funding uh, agency for innovation. Upon return to his uh, home country, he assumed the role of di director, bioeconomy and clean tech at Tekes, which finally evolved later on into to Business Finland. Yamo has gained strong skills in innovation strategy, financing, and business internationalization, especially related to bio, circular economy, and clean tech sectors. Yamo graduated from Helsinki University of Technology and obtained a master's degree in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Yamo, uh, please introduce uh, your organization to us. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. So, uh... Yes, I'm sharing the presentation. Hopefully you see it. All right. So, like Michael mentioned, so uh, uh, some uh, years ago, four years ago, Business Finland was established and we have actually multiple mandates in business Finland where we are <clears throat> act having activities in in uh, bio and circular sector first we are providing funding uh, for research development innovation activities we are challenging companies research organizations to create new innovations collaborate create a uh, collaboration with international partners uh, same time, we are challenging Finnish companies to go global, internationalize their business. So we are helping uh, providing ex export support, so recognizing partners, uh, arranging matchmaking, and so on. And when it's related to uh, uh, innovation in the environment, uh, business in the environment in, in Finland, uh, that's also asset to attract investments to Finland. So. Uh, uh, Finland is a small country, markets are small, so why why the companies are coming usually to Finland? It's be, because of the competence, before, be, because of the environment, business environment, innovation environment there. And the fourth mandate, what we have uh, actually is, is related to tourism, uh, so uh, helping uh, tourists sector companies in Finland, but also trying to attract tourists to, to Finland. And again, here, bioeconomy, uh, clean uh, environment, clean forest are the asset why the tourists are, are coming to Finland. One of our main tools in, in uh, uh, Business Finland is the programs. And uh, uh, we have uh, had uh, already four years uh, by a circular Finland program, uh, having activities related to innovation, uh, in, uh, related to export, uh, and, and trying to create uh, uh, innovation ecosystems which are serving our companies to renew and, and, and have uh, that kind of competence that in the future they succeed in the global markets and here are our priority areas so especially textiles we have put a lot of effort in recent year in this this area packaging uh plastics bioplastic bio-based solution and circular value added 
streams. Uh, we heard this morning that that uh, government can't actually set bio economy, but we we can actually provide maybe carrot and provide tools for for renewables and renewing and and uh, especially our program has done that. So here, brief introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Yamo. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, last but not least, and Mark, I hope you are still awake, uh, but it looks uh, as if you are. Uh, we'll come to you. Mark is responsible uh, at BTG Pectoral Timberland Investment Group uh, for sustainability across uh, the firm's 4.5 billion global timberland portfolio. Uh, I think that's really a impressive number, I must say. Um, and he leads the firm's climate-focused investment practice. Mark joined BTG from global nonprofit The Nature Conservancy, where he led the Global Forestry and Wood Products Program. Previously, Mark served as head of portfolio management, analytics, and research at TIG, co-founded and served as managing director of Equator LLC, a timberland and environmental commodity investment company, directed a joint forest research program of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and Yale University and served as program director of the Yale Tropical Resources Institute. Mark's research has been published in journals such as Sustainability, Forest Ecology and Management, Conservation Biology, New Forests, and the Annual Review of Anthropology. Mark holds a Bachelor of Science in Forest Management from the University of Washington and a Master Degree of Forest Science from Yale University. Mark. Please introduce Thank us to Gene. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I have just a couple of slides to share as well. Uh, so let me go ahead and do that. Um, very good to be here. I'm uh, speaking from um, Seattle, Washington, where the sun is still not up, but the presentation so far have been more powerful than coffee. So I'm very, uh, very pleased to be able to join you all. Um, briefly, the BTG Pactual Timberland Investment Group, we are a part of BTG Pactual, uh, which is the largest Latin American investment bank headquartered in Brazil. Uh, BTG uh, has uh, been around since the, uh, the early 1980s and um, is active globally, but we're really with expertise, particularly in the Americas. Uh, the Timberland Investment Group is a platform that resides within the asset management division of the bank. Um, and we, as uh, the Timberland Investment Group, uh, as, as, as Michael mentioned, we, we manage and administer investments in uh, about 1.2 million hectares of, of commercial, sustainably managed commercial timberlands. We also are uh, specialists in the Americas, so our, our assets are really concentrated in North and South America, uh, across the United States, uh, in uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and, and Chile. And we are uh, primarily producers of, uh, of sustainably uh, harvested uh, timber, uh, but we also, in uh, various businesses, have a step or two down the value chain also to producing uh, products. Um, we have had a, a strong focus on sustainability in our business um, since, uh, since inception. Uh, uh, I would say that we, uh, as a business, our, our, our philosophy or our approach is that uh, we believe that the forest industry, the commercial forest industry, has an awful lot to offer uh, to the dual challenges the, 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 that uh, Rafael uh, identified, uh, the, the, the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change, in that the commercial forest industry already has capacity to manage large landscapes to manage um, at scale, uh, which is critical for uh, both sequestering carbon in forests and for supplying raw materials to the bioeconomy. And the challenge for our industry, for all of us, is to find ways to do that that go above and beyond business as usual, that deliver uh, carbon benefits, uh, biodiversity benefits, social benefits, that go beyond uh, 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 business as usual practice, because that's really what we think is both required to address these crises and uh, very helpfully in our view, and that's increasingly what we see um, the investment community demanding. And so uh, as we uh, face a, a number of crises, uh, including some very proximate and immediate crises like uh, the conflict in Europe and uh, uh, the delinkages of various global uh, supply chains, uh, we also see some very positive um, tailwinds that we think can help drive increased sustainability and drive the growth of, of the sustainable bioeconomy. So very happy to have the chance to talk about that a little bit more with you all today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark, for this uh, very um, good run through. Um, yeah, we, we can just jump into our discussion. Um, last year, around this time, you know, everything was in, in great shape. I think Raphael pointed us uh, to this. So, you know, stock markets uh, were, were peaking, at least from today's perspective. Interest rates were uh, really low. All this has changed. Um, of course, uh, the ongoing uh, COVID pandemic is just one thing, but uh, there's also a new political crisis with the war in, in Ukraine and probably in Asia, also some potential conflicts. Uh, all this has uh, made the financial markets uh, that we are in more shaky. Um, you can see this when you look at uh, stock market indices, ma major indices down by 20%. Question is, is this already the bottom? Normally in crisis, it, it goes even down further. Um, especially the Q3 reports that we are waiting for uh, may um, you know, uh, show us the real impact uh, on, on the businesses. So this may cause some uh, further uh, pressure on the stock prices. Um, high energy costs mentioned also by Rafael, supply chain distortions, um, and potentially also uh, declining purchasing power at uh, consumers may may cause uh, trouble. And at the same time, uh, inflation goes up. Uh, the FED and um, the ECB have uh, raised the interest rates. So all this is um, yeah creating a much uh, different setting from from last year. So this is basically the the environment we are in now, Virginia. When I uh, look at um, CBEU, you are a public-private partnership, um, and you have just uh, put forward in June your first uh, call for um, 120 million euros uh, in the circular bioeconomy. In light of all these, let's say, negative developments um, in our financial environment, uh, does this crisis impact your program? And if so, why? Okay, first of all, I think uh, we have a, a big role to play because uh, we are a public-private partnership at European level, so we can give stability in a moment of uncertainty. The fact that we have been able to issue the call and that this uh, uh, create a condition for industry to, to keep the interest and to participate, uh, it's extremely important. So I think it's a message to say that the public side have a big role to play and is uh, to ensure that uh, the disruption are not affecting also the planning of the instruments that we have. And that's, uh, uh, I believe, uh, something important at this moment. Of course, we are facing uh, still effects, uh, important one, especially from the COVID side. So we also have to, and we, we are flexible in that sense to absorb these negative uh, impacts. And in particular, I make the example of the of COVID impacts. Um, we have uh, most of our projects that have faced delay and difficulties uh, to complete in the original time frame. So we had really to demonstrate the capacity to absorb this delay also from our programs. And this again, in the instrument that we have, we have this flexibility. So a message I think for everyone is that in terms of create crisis, uh, there are certain parts of us that have to be the one that are more resilient and are more flexible to accommodate uh, the challenges that we have. Another thing uh, that we are currently discussing is indeed the impact on the access of the biomaterial that we need, the bio, uh, the, the, the feedstock, in fact, uh, and uh, the material that is needed for our project, uh, and as well the impact of the increase of prices uh, of, the, of the energy. But this for us uh, can create opportunity. And I'll, I'll stop with this message because in an innovation program, uh, research innovation program like ours, priority will be also given to find new sources of biomass and in particular of how we can use residuum byproducts and everything. And as well, new way of uh, developing technologies that are less energy consuming that are more efficient and that can also close the loop. So in our biorefinery, we can indeed tackle the problem of the energy increase in a smarter way. So what we are going to do in our program is to transform the threat in a challenge and to push the industry to provide solutions that can in, indeed create autonomy, to increase competitiveness and solve some of the problems that we are facing now. Thank you, Virginia. It's uh, also good uh, to um, uh, show the opportunities that are in such situations. I think this is really important also to focus on because uh, um, that's uh, what the future is about. 
Uh, ben, um, the Green uh, Climate Fund uh, has in its strategy uh, to crowd in uh, private finance um, and uh, notably for the adaptation of nature-based solutions. Um, and how do you see the, let's say, global and currently financial markets, um, you know, uh, yeah, um, influencing your business and, and uh, the ability also for, for smaller uh, and, and innovative uh, companies in the bioeconomy to raise funds? Um, yeah, thanks, Mayor. Well, first of all, just let me um, put this into into a couple of um, contexts. First of all, as far as the GCF, um, are the finance that we have to work with is concerned. Uh, um, we uh, carried out a replenishment of our current uh, phase um, before the um, the the uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so we already have uh, we already know that the funds that we have to work with and that we are able to uh, to disperse. Um, and uh, um, Secondly, I'd like to put this question in into a broader context of, of the, the challenges facing climate finance in the long term. A GCF mandate emerged from the common understanding among parties to the UNFCCC that the Paris Agreement needed a third pillar in addition to the objectives for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, and that this pillar was a commitment to scale up climate finance. There needed to be a clear message about the true scale of additional finance required to address the climate crisis and a clear commitment through the Paris Agreement for industrialized countries in particular to provide it. Uh, so in, in Cancun and COP16, um, OECD member states committed to an annual disbursement of $100 billion of climate finance to developing countries by 2020. Um, it's not easy to verify exactly whether this commitment has been met, but OECD studies indicated that by 2018, the annual amount of finance mobilized by developed countries specifically for climate mitigation and adaptation purposes in developing countries was about $80 billion. But at the same time, the IPCC confirmed how woefully inadequate even meeting this commitment would be in terms of addressing the Paris Agreement objectives, estimating that energy sector alone would need about $2 trillion annually by 2030 in order to meet mitigation targets. So us, GCF as the world's largest climate fund, we directly mobilize about $2 billion per year, and our board has approved nearly $11 billion of GCF finance across all sectors to date. The portfolio is worth about $40 billion with co-financing ratio of one to four. But in order just to meet the climate finance commitment made at Cancun, we would need to mobilize additional finance at a rate of about one to 50. So GCF, while an important part of the global strategy to meet climate finance commitments, is best viewed as a catalyst towards these commitments, not the major channel. So in short, the effect of recent geopolitical developments on the availability of capital for the bioeconomy is not insignificant, but in terms of climate finance, is dwarfed by the medium to long-term challenges. And in the short term, markets may remain risk averse when it comes to the bioeconomy, particularly in emerging and frontier markets where the potential benefits are greatest. The GCF can play an important part in meeting the challenge of financing bioeconomy investments through our mandate to provide concessional finance for investments which have a demonstrable climate impact, including debt, equity, and guarantees, as well as grants and thus reduce the risk to private investment, crowding in finance to climate-focused initiatives. Um, I hope that uh, helps to clarify our contribution. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, um, Ben. Um, that was very insightful. Um, Yamo, you have been um, now for the, with, with the bioeconomy um, for, for some time in, in your career, and um, I think that's probably a very interesting to to look back and um, also look back into the financing situations of the bioeconomy in let's say the past uh, two decades. Um, how does the current situation um, compare to um, previous situations? We have heard from uh, Ben a very interesting statement. Uh, and this is uh, probably a short term, but in the long term it will uh, you know be good. So there's short-term challenge, but uh, long-term optimism. How, how do you see this? Yes, so um, in short term, definitely, uh, when we are looking uh, for industries, companies, uh, they are making at the moment analysis and, and they are probably a little bit careful what they are going to do. 
that's that's always when there is a, this, this kind of destruction. But as we have heard today several times, this is also the time to really make a difference, make a move to the transition, make an investment. And here the government has a role. Uh, now it has been earlier, like a pandemic came uh, COVID-19 three years ago. There was a role for government really give the tools, maybe maybe the challenge the companies now that you need to do that kind of uh, movements where you actually uh, increase your resilience, where you, you uh, move to that kind of thing that if there's coming another pandemia, you survive. You are, you are even, even, even better uh, uh, place. And uh, same thing in, in uh, financial crisis 2008. Government put their, their uh, certain kind of uh, uh, actions where we were helping companies really to renew, look forward, not like like what has happened, but but look forward that how they could be stronger in the future. And this is now the time, really. Uh, like like uh, uh, Raphael actually introduced exactly now, not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That makes uh, a lot of sense. And I, I think it's uh, probably useful to look into the learnings uh, from the past. And uh, I think even that situation, as tough as it is right now, it will probably uh, not be there uh, forever. Mark, um, your company is one of the largest investors in the forestry sector, especially uh, private investments in, in forests is needed. Um, uh, to achieve uh, the Paris climate goals. At the same time, you know, we, we saw that the stock markets uh, uh, crashed. And and what does it mean for, for investors in, in your funds? Um, do they invest? Do they say, oh, we, we, you know, have problems in our portfolios, we need to rebalance and, and we take a wait and see position? Or do they say, um, yeah, this is uh, something uh, that we think is short term and, and uh, we, we invest and forest investments is part of you know our sustainability approach and uh, last but not least some of your end markets may have also been affected uh, yesterday one of the bigger paper manufacturers in in germany um, filed for bankruptcy because of the high energy costs some of the end markets for the forest products also may change right yes good question and i think we're we're seeing um uh shifts in 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 uh end product markets um in response to uh, uh, in, in response to increasing interest rates, to increasing inflation, um, uh, to slowdowns in economic activity, and those vary um, uh, by market and, and by region. Um, but it, it, forests as a whole, or, or forests as, as the source of the raw materials, as the source of the feedstock for all of these industries, actually have uh, historically had a sort of counter cyclical uh, uh, behavior. That is that. Um, Historically, forests have actually been uh, positively, or forest investments have historically been positively correlated with inflation and are often seen as uh, a, uh, a, a hedge against um, uh, a global volatility. Because when one invests in forests, one's investing in real assets, in land and in trees, and in the management of forests uh, themselves, there's a lot of optionality. We have options with regards to when we choose to harvest trees. We can, uh, in many cases, uh, keep trees in the forest if markets are down, allow them to continue to grow. Uh, there's a saying that, that the trees don't read the, the headlines of the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. They continue to, to grow day in and day out as long as they have sunlight and rainfall. So the forest themselves can, can be an attractive uh, financial investment for, for many investors in uh, periods of, of, of global economic uncertainty and volatility. I would say that there are also some some important tailwinds that are are, are at work um, there in in spite of these crises, and and we will certainly between now and 2030 and 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 2040 and 2050 as we work towards all these goals, we will of course face many crises in addition to the crises of biodiversity and climate. Um, we will need to address many sort of proximate challenges, um, but. I think we've really seen in the investor uh, community a shift in the recognition of the urgency of climate. 
Um, the net zero asset managers uh, uh, initiative now has more than 250 signatories committing more than $60 trillion in investment portfolios to, to net zero. Uh, the net zero asset owners alliance is over 10 trillion. These are very, very significant uh, uh, amounts of capital. And these commitments have yet to be realized, but um, these, uh, in our experience, are very serious commitments from these investors who are actively now seeking ways to expose their capital to investments that reduce or even neutralize their, their overall uh, uh, carbon exposure or carbon footprint. And forests, and, and, and by extension, the value chain that forests supply, the bioeconomy value chain, are one of the few opportunities that are, are available today to do uh, such investment at scale. So, so that, even in the face, I think, of all this uncertainty, is continuing to, to support a high degree of investor interest in, in the space. And I'd also say that um, as we are seeing, you know, the era of globalization at least slow, uh, you know, uh, as we're seeing uh, global supply chains uh, be disrupted by the pandemic, by uh, geopolitical events, and as more uh, more companies are reevaluating the risks associated with having supply chains that um, perhaps uh, span uh, multiple countries or are connected uh, to uh, partners that uh, with whom uh, political or or uh, geopolitical relations are are strained, there is an additional benefit to um, to bio resources in that uh, bio resources tend to be very well distributed around the world. Not all countries have r large forest resources or large agricultural resources, but many countries do have uh, significant bioresources, which means that most countries either have or have uh, trading partners, longstanding trading partners or, or, or allies with such resources. And so I think that bioresources are also increasingly seen as uh, a potentially reliable uh, a distributed source of raw material for supply chains. And I think that also is continuing to support interest in um, emerging uh, 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 emerging biomaterials and in, and in shifting increasingly um, supply to uh, bioresources for strategic reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mark. That was really a strong case for the bioeconomy, not only for the forest as such, with some interesting features, especially from an investor's uh, perspective. Um, before we, we have some uh, minutes left before we open up uh, for the uh, um, uh, broader uh, discussion um, with uh, the um, audience. Um, I would like to uh, learn from you uh, in very brief um, answers. Um, what are the, from your perspective, um, most important uh, sectors in the bioeconomy and investment themes uh, that are currently evolving. Um, I think uh, Virginia mentioned, uh, of course, uh, priority is given to um, uh, to circularity and new biomasses. What what especially are you looking uh, for in in these uh, um, yeah sectors? Uh, maybe I can elaborate a little bit further. In fact, uh, what we are looking is to exploit a new source of feedstock, in particular secondary feedstock uh, and residues and uh, coming from uh, waste uh, stream brought from uh, industrial, but also from municipal waste, where we believe there is also high potential and uh, something that uh, need really research and innovation. But as well, uh, developing capacity where there are untapped resources, especially in Central and European, Eastern European. And uh, uh, we still believe that uh, we have a huge potential that is not yet fully exploited. So these are from the biomass and feedstock sites, uh, for sure, two main uh, stream of priorities. Regarding the productions and the products that we are tackling, uh, we see that um, we need indeed not only to think about uh, how we produce, how we reduce the CO2 emission, how we ensure that we are not polluting, but as well, how do we create uh, materials and products with certain properties that may allow the recyclability, reuse. Uh, and so the circularity dimension become part also of the challenge we have to take. And this tackle many different sectors. I can mention just a few to tell you where we see the majority at least of interest also from the industry side. And of course, uh, the packaging and bioplastic is clearly one of the biggest area of investment and interest. But as well, I saw a lot of growth of interest in the building and 
construction part because of course there as well we need to heavily decarbonize the sector and there is an interest especially from the European Union side. We have a lot also to do in the food and f- feed the protein, uh, let's say, side on the nutrition side that uh, create a huge dependency, especially at European level. These are, I would say, three macro sectors where we are investing massively. And then there are other sectors that are a little bit more smaller, more niche that are growing. For example, we are investing now a lot also on the aquatic side. There is a high potential there with uh, the needs of supporting, especially small SME to grow and to to develop the capacity, as well the sustainable textile, again, a a niche that is very interesting for us and that have a huge potential also in market uptake. That's to mention a few. So we have some macro areas where we, we really need to focus, but also very smaller and niche areas that have a huge potential of growth and that are of impact for all of us. So few additions on on what we said before. Yeah, thank you, Virginia. That uh, uh, looks almost com- comprehensive. Uh, but I think there's clear. You mentioned there's some themes that are more pronounced than than others, which probably are also uh, understandable from the Europeans' perspective as of today. Um, ben, you you have the more global uh, view. What are the trends that you are seeing? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to support what. Uh... Mark said earlier that uh, really we see, despite the short-term um, uh, uh, financial trends, there, there's consistent interest and, and appetite for for investment in forest and land use, and but that will make consistent. What the GCF is, is well placed to do is to um, assist in the existing uh, uh, um, investment interest to expand into maybe high-risk areas and emerging and frontier markets. Um, about 25% of our funds uh, are channeled towards mitigation through the forest and land use sector or through adaptation to adaptation through agriculture, ecosystems and ecosystem services. So already there's there's a lot of interest and we see that continuing. Um, well-designed investments in bioeconomy sectors are highly likely to have a beneficial impact in terms of mitigation or adaptation, and particularly in the forest and forest products industry uh, in both. Um, so compared to other sectors um, such as energy or transport, the cost effectiveness of investments in bioeconomy initiatives in terms of mitigation in particular is, is highly favorable. Um, many GCF projects with mitigation impacts in reduced deforestation are projected to cost just uh, 2 to $5 per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So uh, a very good uh, um, good effectiveness. Over the past couple of years, many of our largest investments have been in the bioeconomy sector, um, and we're increasingly seeing exciting opportunities in programs with adaptation impacts, as well as mitigation. Um, a couple of examples, the Amazon Bioeconomy Fund, there's $275 million of GCF uh, and $390 million of co-financing uh, covering six countries in the Amazon Basin, um, with the Inter-American Development Bank implementing, and this channels concessional loan finance to uh, small and medium enterprises operating in sustainable and climate resilient value chains, uh, in coffee, cocoa, Brazil nut, uh-huh. indigenous timber plantations, aquaculture, and wilderness tourism. We have a global fund for the coral reefs investment window, which is the first such initiative focused explicitly on directing investment to initiatives which contribute to the protection and restoration of coral reefs which will use $125 million of GCF finance equity for projects in sustainable fishing, tourism, and reducing runoff from pollution, so helping to maintain the critical function of these ecosystems. And uh, last year also saw the first phase of GCF's inclusive green financing initiative in the Great Green Wall, where $127 million of GCF grant and loan finance focuses on building climate resilient and low carbon practices for 10 agricultural value chains in five Sahel and West African countries. So there's great potential to in, in, in increase this bioeconomy component of our portfolio. Um, we look to see uh, particularly uh, potential for leveraging investment in zero deforestation commodities in line with the developments in policy and legislation in this context, particularly in the EU, US and UK. And we'll explore opportunities to build the necessary technical, institutional and financial frameworks 
in producer countries. We're also very keen, just lastly, to invest in projects and programs that underline the potential for the timber and for our products industry to contribute to climate change solutions. This is currently a, a gap in our portfolio, and we'd welcome proposals in this area. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, since we are over time, I nevertheless would be interested to hear um, from uh, Ramo and, and, and Mark uh, um, probably more short uh, statements on where you see see the potential from your perspective. Jamo, please uh, start. Thank you. Yeah, there has been already pretty inclusive lists, but but uh, in, in a finished point of view, like like I mentioned, uh, uh, textiles, wood fiber based textiles, that's a really interesting area, sustainable packaging and, and uh, bio-based plastics, for example. And interesting is that there has been maybe 10 to 15 years research behind, innovation work behind, and in several sectors we are seeing now, that they are leading actually to first commercial investments, to demonstration and investments. So there has been done a lot of work, and now we are seeing actually already concrete things. Uh, one maybe interesting area will be in future, not no yet, but pretty pretty soon anyway. The bias is EU and and power to X area. How to actually you capture CC CO two, and and uh, that would be like a raw material for feedstock in 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 future. Of course, using the hydrogen there, that that could be interesting area. Yeah, and to be defined whether that would be part of our bioeconomy definition, at least for our fund, but uh, I think it's needed and it will not be exactly. the bioeconomy alone um, in that sense. Mark, um, how do you see it? Yeah, maybe I just identify one um, recent trend that I think is is promising. Um, uh, in the policy realm in the last year or two, I think we've seen an increasing uh, recognition of embodied carbon, uh, that is of the, the emissions associated with the production of different materials. Um, in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the name of, of what was really a large piece of climate legislation that just passed, includes about $4 billion uh, targeted in various ways for uh, low embodied carbon construction. And we're seeing uh, embodied carbon uh, uh, legislation move forward in the state of California. Um, so just some examples here from the US. But I think that's very promising because uh, embodied carbon is a, is a, a critical impact uh, on the climate of, of all of the materials that we use, and it is not, for the most part, currently recognized uh, in ways that allow decision makers um, to uh, select lower embodied carbon materials. So the, the policy recognition and the development of policy uh, uh, tools and mechanisms uh, to account for embodied carbon, I think, um, would tend in many cases to favor the bioeconomy um, uh, and uh, I, I think are a very promising um, development in, in, in climate policy generals, generally. So I, I think that that's very encouraging. Yeah, that, I think that's really important. And uh, I'm also aware of uh, this, that California is playing an important role to establish these frameworks. And, you know, uh, this is really important to, to get it uh, comprehensively resolved and uh, we have seen many good things coming from California, maybe this as well. So um, could serve as a blueprint for, for other regions uh, on this planet. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. First and foremost, up to here uh, to uh, my um, wonderful panelists. And uh, I'm now asking uh, Ruka. Ruka, can you hear us? Um, yes, we are here. Uh, yes, okay, we are fine. here. So, Yes, we are here. Yeah, Michael, one, one question maybe out of our audience here, just a provocative one. You brought up a lot of positive examples for financing of the bioeconomy. Uh, maybe you said there's a possibility. There are some winners now, just now, out of this, all of these uh, problems worldwide. Some companies earn a lot of money. Does it make sense anyhow? Is there a chance to get some of that money for our approaches for the bioeconomy. What do you believe? Is there a slight chance anyhow to come in touch with these winners of this situation to get their money for our purposes? What do you think? Yeah, who, who wants to answer? I think it's probably hard to get money from Gazprom. Uh, uh, but, for uh, sure not Gazprom, but, uh, but some, some others maybe. No, no, no I, I know where the question is, is going, but um, yeah. 
interesting to hear from the panelists what what your view is on on this do you think you know we have for instance it's probably more a question for for europe these days because uh, as part of the energy crisis and i think that's the background needed here to to answer uh, this uh, we have seen some companies uh, making tremendous profits right and and the question is can we um, you know uh, move that into certain directions i start with uh, uh, Raphael, to bring you back into the conversation after your uh, great um, keynote, uh, what's your view? No, I think that's a great question, and indeed, I just wanted to to make one comment on your original question on on where are we on on financing correct the transition, and, and maybe as an economist, I wanted to bring maybe a, one additional aspect on this perspective. So one is in the before addressing the final question that you have. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that you have a cycle correct on the economic side. So we have been going through, if you look at economic science from 1870, we moved from basically monetarism to Keynesian policies to in the 70s, in the 40s, we moved to Keynesian policies, so fiscal policies, uh, fundamentally taking the lead and great involvement on the government. Since the 70s, in a similar period like now, we move into monetarism. So basically, uh, monetary policy is taking the role and fiscal policy is taking a much less invasive role, basically having uh, debt uh, at the minimum. We knew that leaving markets operating alone in the 2008 crisis is not the best way, because at the end, if you left markets to operate by themselves, you have a crisis, like the crisis that we have on the financial crisis. And this is when we move to a mix of policies between fiscal and monetary policies. So where are we on the cycle? The reality is that the current situation is basically moving us into an environment of constrained carbon, because we need to address carbon, constrained capital, because governments have less space to apply, uh, let's say, fiscal policies, not the appetite. I think they really want to genuine help, but there is less space on the budget to help. And of course, less capital because monetary policies need to be tighter. So that basically meaning that kind of uh, at the end of the risk of a period called the end of the great moderation that we have been enjoying in the last 20 years, where we have low interest rates, happy, happy access, or basically easy access to low capital, and basically most of the ideas could actually play a role. In this carbon-constrained world and capital-constrained world, it's much more important to do what we did in the 70s, that is basically going back to the principles of microeconomic policy. That basically applied to some of the things that you have been mentioning, applied innovation, fast return on capital for certain things, and basically stimulating supply things and in innovation to really be targeted on addressing these things. So in this space, if we are in a capital constrained world and in a carbon constrained world and in a time constrained world, because we want to do that as fast as possible, the answer, the question that it was posed for the audience is a very relevant one. And indeed, I've been advocating in certain forums that indeed, if we are in this such a kind of emergency, what is the point to have dividends or to have share buybacks? Is that the best use to do certain things under kind of the current crisis that we have? So I don't have an answer of what should be done, but certainly deserve a very careful study on what is the best use of having corporate profits to use in the best way for addressing this innovation, where, by the way, it's a growth opportunity. So I think that's the most important thing. So I think it is a very important question and it needs to be addressed properly. And I think industry also creating the framework. I mean, there are other ways to do that. Like I said, high carbon prices or other things can accelerate that. Micro policies can accelerate that. But this is a very important question to be addressed in the right forum. So I think it's not, it's not a kind of a kind of uh, an, an important one. It's a very important one, considering the economic cycle where we are as well. That's important. Thank you, Rafael. Yamo. Yeah, same thing like Rafael. Don't know what happens that money. Well, but but anyway, yeah, money usually goes there where it's a growth, like Rafael said in the end. So. Uh, uh, there is a need for sustainable feedstock, raw materials, bio-based materials in the future. Sure, regulation is, is guiding somehow. There is any way uh, demand will be more and more for, for the direction. So uh, when, when there is need for sustainability, there is a need for, for, for uh, renewable uh, raw materials. And when there is a growth, 
uh, money goes there, definitely. I believe in that. Thank you. Um, Luca, are there uh, more questions? No, thank you. We are already here. It's fine so far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then we still have some minutes left. Don't we? Yeah, we, or are we? Michael, would you like to summarize a little bit your I can session, do. please? Yeah. I only to, to, to sum it up, please. Yeah, so um, we have had a very interesting um, panel discussion. Um, and uh, I think what is clear is that the public still plays an important role uh, to take out risks in, in the bioeconomy um, and also to prioritize um, topics that are of general interest for society. Um, for instance, uh, what Virginia mentioned is focus on uh, valorizing uh, waste streams and, and biomass. So to make, you know, also regions more independent uh, from, from the global system. I think that's also a political uh, intention. Um, we also um, see and have learned that uh, um, forests uh, can be important uh, because of their yeah, let's say decoupled character, trees grow uh, irrespective of uh, the political crisis and uh, uh, these um, assets can be managed from an investor's perspective uh, very, very efficiently and also uh, provide um, good returns. Uh, when it comes to the uh, sectors um, that are of interest, um, it is waste streams and valorization of waste streams, new biomasses, uh, what we have heard. But it's also uh, what uh, Ben mentioned, I found very interesting, is, um, you know, um, adaptation, but also uh, ecosystem services. I think ecosystem services, we haven't had the time to touch upon this extensively, but uh, this is, um, could be, uh, especially in, in the countries that have a lot of uh, forests, be an important uh, tool to to finance uh, forests and generate uh, returns from forests. But of course, there are also uh, some frameworks uh, being required. Um, then we have uh, talked about um, uh, hot sectors in, in Finland, and I could not agree more. It's, uh, um, you know, based probably on the uh, heritage of uh, the paper industry. It's textiles uh, recycling. Um, and at the same time, also uh, making wood fibers for, for new and more sustainable applications, for instance, in, in packaging, um, embodied carbon uh, as a new business concept uh, uh, put forward uh, by Mark, for instance, in, in construction, um, but also um, for, for other applications. I think that's, that's uh, an emerging concept, which we see right now. In California, it requires new frameworks and, and new ways to, uh, to to monitor, account, and audit. I think this uh, is probably uh, very relevant um, and could be a blueprint for, for other regions um, on this um, um, very, uh, on this planet. And then um, Raphael pointed us uh, and reminded us of uh, the carbon and capital constraint. And maybe to comment on one of your last points, uh, Raphael, I think you mentioned this in your um, keynote. Um, right now, we don't uh, factor in all the costs appropriately. So um, we are not on a growth uh, curve GDP-wise, but we are on a decline for some decades. And I think um, uh, we need to manage somehow uh, to, of course, factor in uh, these costs. Um, if we would do it right now, it probably would mean that we have to give up a lot of our wealth that we have created in the societies. But maybe it's just a perceived wealth because we only look at a part of the story uh, that we want to see. So it may not be fully sustainable what we are doing um, right now. Yeah, this would be the summary. I really regret that we do not have more time uh, to discuss this. Uh, I think we have a highly competent uh, uh, panel that has... Uh, different views and, and also uh, in-depth views on, on certain aspects uh, in financing uh, the bioeconomy, contributing to more sustainable economies. With that, I would like to hand uh, back to, to Ruka, unless you have some additional points and remarks. 
Oh, I think I think Michael, I just wanted to add one second to your to your uh, final comment, and I probably you have seen that um, in a great summary of the of the of the panel today. Uh, probably you saw a couple of days ago, President Macron uh, was making the statement that we are facing kind of interesting or difficult times ahead of us um, in this carbon constrained time, if you want, a world that we are we are moving now, especially in Europe. And, and he was talking about the end of abundance, but I think building on what you said, I think probably we are not moving into the end of abundance because in reality, some of the things that we have, we never really need in the first space. But certainly we are moving into the end of waste. And I think this is a society where we have a great obligation to really start maximizing some of the things, and especially related to nature and, and value. And I think indeed, if we put a lot of focus on what nature and biodiversity and resources can do, we could actually turn really moving the, the, the growth equation back into positive. But certainly, again, the current formulas don't reflect where we are, but we have a great opportunity to move it back into, into yes, the end of waste, I will put it kind of quoting President Macron, the end of abundance. So we have a great opportunity here. Thank you, Rafael. I think I couldn't have uh, phrased this uh, in a better way. I think that's uh, a great final word. Uh, Rukan, now, it's with you again. And now Ruka is back. Here we are, Michael. Are you still with us? You are still yes, with I us? Am. Okay, very yes. good. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this okay, great panel again. So uh, I think that was already the okay, third time you were running this at okay, sustainable finance. It was all a lot of good topics that okay, uh, you were sharing together with your panelists. So what, okay, uh, maybe the one question to you, so okay, that uh, since the last forum, okay, did you find anything new or any major trends since then, okay, the last forum from Brazil? especially when it comes to sustainable financing, so uh... Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, uh, I think the, the world um, has changed, uh, but uh, also what Yamo mentioned is holds uh, true. Uh, we are now seeing the companies that have been incubated over the last decades, um, mm -hmm. bringing their products to market. So this is very important to keep in mind, right? It's uh, There's no short-term response because we are talking about uh, deep tech. I think that was also Raphael's point, right? It's ah, about yeah. chemistry and it's not short-term uh, developments. So we need to keep on going, um, doing um, early stage research, uh, but also then, you know, taking uh, the companies uh, to the next level that they can really sell their products. And uh, some sometimes there are gaps and, and uh, there's a desert in between and uh, uh, the public um, and, and public private investors, mm. they, they can bridge this, uh, but we see great trends. Um, especially in recycling of waste streams and it um, will be needed also to um, yeah to to make full use of the biomass so one of the most interesting fields but also one of the most risky ones still from an investor perspective is uh, refining biomass right especially lignocellulosic oh. biomass uh, could uh, provide great opportunities but there are still i would say you know, you have to valorize all of the biomass and there's still some some challenges with regard to technology mm. because the technology determines the product and then product acceptance. So it's also with the consumer to educate the consumer and, and make him aware what, what is more sustainable um, when compared to incumbent players. So but we see in the sure. biorefineries, as I would say this is uh, really where um, where there's a big opportunity, but it's also, it's also risky because you have to invest a lot and you don't know what the result will be. So Indeed. you have to also find ways how to deal with that as an investment uh, community uh, and, and to advance these topics. Sustainable food is, a is I would say, also big on the agenda, uh, like Virginia said, and uh, mm -hmm. alternative protein, that's another big trend. But uh, there, I think we are already in, in I, I would say, doing fine, right? It's more to bring this to market and to educate the consumer and move the consumer away from unsustainable, um, at least in our regions, right, in mm, in yeah, Europe yeah. and North America to, to switch them to more uh, sustainable nutrition. 
Indeed, indeed. Yeah, okay, uh, what I felt out of this uh, discussion that okay, that there is that okay, uh, let's say okay, interest, great interest uh, over the biomass, as was mentioned by okay, Virginia, Oben, and Raphael, and even the urgency, like okay, mentioned by by Raphael, in terms of okay, climate change mitigation, okay, uh, measures that okay, we need to do it today, not tomorrow, not the day after. We need to do that tomorrow, today. So there is an urgency. So uh, somehow, to okay, create okay, the balance in between these all things. So it is, in some respect, it is quite fragmented. That okay, how to tap in with these all these that okay, the requirements or all these expectation. Mm -hmm. And in every day, one can always ask that okay, do we have land enough? Do we have land enough for all these issues that okay, which are now raising? So. Uh, that is a big question. I don't think that, okay, we cannot answer that now, but okay, let's leave that okay for the next session or so. So uh, thanks, Mihail, again for your great work. And thanks for the panelists. Thanks for the Virginia. Thanks for the Ben, Jarmo, Mark. You did a great job. So uh, good to have you with us and hopefully you can still stay with us for the next session. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for my end as well. And Mark, have a good night, yeah. even though it is short. Oh, yeah. Okay, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> we see Mark, yeah. Another Mark. I think we have a, okay, uh, Ida also here together with us. Am I right? We should have. It's pretty late for Ida, so she's yeah, still in she Sydney. <laughs> okay, what are your takeaways, Ida, at this point of time? Uh, but this very, very rich uh, presentation and information. Yeah. I uh, My takeaway is probably two main things. What what Ravel said before, you know, like um, that the war in Europe will shift to war on climate, and that's basically a, a wake up call for us. Mm. Um, now, the the role of sustainable bioeconomy uh, industry will become more and more important, you know, to mm. to help change the red code to green code, like Ravel said before, and it's related to what Mark was saying as well about investment in 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 bioeconomy you know um we think um there's a discussion that we think that it would be a mix of uh carbon tax reduction and carbon, carbon credits some mm. kind of a subsidy need to be um uh done to support uh bioeconomy industry as well but at the same time to go the red code well, we see there's a, a, a negative impact from climate change already affecting the and also increase the risk in such investment. Mm. So it was also discussed. This basically also means that we need to change our business as usual. The red code means a need to change business as, as usual to improve sustainability and accountability of the bioeconomy industry players. Um, right now. I think those two mm -hmm. are the main key takeaway for me. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Quite good. It's That's pretty true. late already for you there in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but we carry on here. Mark, what's next? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, next, uh, I believe we have a, a coffee break next. But uh, oh, yeah. is there anything you'd like to say about the day? Um, or are we going to finish up? Yeah, we will finish later on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's yeah. have a coffee break. So now, now we go and, on to a coffee break. Nice to see Ada. Uh, it's been a great day. And uh, we're back in 20 minutes.